Good morning, everybody. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas. Uh, why don't you guys just stand up and sing and worship with us today? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Who's the mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings
shall be holding. Dreams awaken in this moment. Spirit, come. Spirit, come. Pour it out. Let your love run Your glory fill this house. Pour it out. Let your love run over. Hear it now. Let your glory fill this His power is within us. We will rise to be your witness. Spirit, come. Spirit, come. Pour it out. Pour it out. Let your love run over. Hear it now. Let your glory this house, pour it out, let your love run over, hear it now, let your glory fill this Let 
assembly this morning. You may have a seat. You know, I think uh, as Christians and maybe especially people that, that preach or teach, we're always looking for some kind of formula to figure things out. And this isn't a formula, but as we prepare for today's offering, I think it's a, a point of notice. In Matthew chapter 2, 
Verse 9, after these magi had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw him, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming in the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then, they, and then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of, of incense, and of myrrh. And uh, there's something about giving worship to God that prepares that next step of worship, which is giving. And uh, again, this isn't uh, some formula, you know, you sing and then you give, and that's why we do it like this. No, it's just traditionally why we sing and then we give. But uh, what, a, what a good lesson for us to remember that in our worship, uh, flowing from that is a heart to give. And I appreciate your heart to give today, this year, and we just want to pray a blessing over today's offering. Lord, thank you that we have the privilege and the honor of giving. Lord, it is truly from the depths of our heart, and I pray that you would bless these gifts, God. May they be uh, a fragrance to you uh, and joy, uh, enjoyable to you because of the heart and the life that they come from. We give it to you freely today. In Jesus' name, amen. Christmas Eve. Anybody here Christmas Eve? A bunch of you. Okay, let me ask you a question just because I did. did is anybody wearing the same clothes that you wore on Christmas Eve? Because they're really the only festive clothes that you have on. Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't have all the same clothes on, if you know what I mean, but I do have the same shirt and sweater. And, and I'm good with that because it's, you know, it's just whatever. It's what I, what I did. So I was hoping I wasn't alone, but obviously I am. Uh, Hey, a couple things to make sure you're aware of is uh, make sure you sign up for the day of prayer, New Year's Eve day. We have prayer. The building will be open for prayer. We'll have worshipful, powerful music on. And uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., find a slot. And uh, there, there might be a little confusion. I, I really think there is or shouldn't be. Is that just because somebody signed up at 7 a.m., if somebody's there, go to their right. And you, we could have 100 people here, 200 people here in the same time slot. So uh, make sure you sign up for a time of prayer that day. They're in half-hour segments. You can stay for an hour. Uh, you can go come pray before work, after work at your lunch hour, if you work close, whatever you'd like to do, we want to make sure that you make that day uh, a day of prayer. Also, this coming Wednesday, the 29th, there will be no Wednesday night activities, no Bible study, no Rangers, no girls ministries. So again, make sure that you're aware of that for this coming Wednesday, the 29th. Then the 30th, 
which will be this Thursday. We're going to have a New Year event here. And actually, for those uh, that are leaders in the youth ministry or students in the youth ministry or any, just any adults in general that would like to volunteer, we need to move these chairs in stacks of six. How many? Six. Uh, along these walls here, along here, not along front, but along the walls or on the edge here, we're just going to stack all these chairs so we can prepare and get ready uh, for our events coming up this coming Thursday night. And those are the announcements for today. Make sure you grab one if you have it on the way in or on the way out. God bless you guys. Now, see, I wouldn't have thought you had the same thing on because it was dark in here pretty much Friday night. Yeah, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have said anything if I were you, but you know. I mean, I get dressed in the dark oftentimes, but anyways, uh, I had a bunch of Santa jokes I was going to share, but I'm just looking at you guys, and you can't take it. You just can't take it. You're just wiped out. Friday night, <clears throat> you know, Saturday, all day yesterday, with family and fr friends and whatever else you did. Uh, that day after Christmas feeling is here in the room. So I'll just pray and we'll go home, okay? No, just, no. Um, no, just again, a couple of reminders. As Pastor Hans said, he needs help uh, today after service. Get these chairs out of the way. And uh, Thursday night is the New Year's event for the youth. And again, our prayer event Friday, 7 to 7. And you know, you really don't have to sign up. If you leave today and you don't sign up, and you want to show up, you're welcome. We have plenty of room here, uh, and we do want to pray. That's what we need to do. Our, you know, our world needs our intercession. And thank God that we have one who's at the right hand of the Father right now, ever, forever making intercession for us. Praise God. And we have his Holy Spirit living inside of us. But we're at the, uh, we're at the closing of a year. We're turning that calendar uh, in just another week. This is our last Sunday morning together in 2021. And we need to pray that 2022 be spectacular, that it be stellar, that pandemic would go back, you know, the, the whole virus thing just go right to hell where it belongs. Too many lives have been lost, too much grief, too much pain, too much division. I can just go on. I can just preach that as a message. But really, we need to, we need to take care of this thing. So I encourage you to be here Friday and again, be in prayer as we close out this year. We do still have 2022 calendars. <clears throat> And uh, if you didn't get one, please get one. They're on the information desk uh, on your way out today. If you want one for someone, feel free. Because as you know, with these calendars, every month that goes by, they become less valuable. So get them out there. And then finally, too, uh, last Sunday, we took a special offering for uh, the Fire Bible. And you can still give. We'd, like, we'd urge you to give online. There's a giving button for the Fire Bible, and you can still do that through the end of this year. You can do it all next year, but we want to be able to send them funds now, so, so please do that. All right, well, listen, um, today's message is from Joshua chapter 10, and um, we're going to be looking at the first 15 verses. We're going to be talking about friendships and alliances, and so let's go ahead and start with Joshua chapter 10, verse 1. Now... Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai and all its men were good fighters. And so Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmut, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. And then the five kings and the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us, help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. And so Joshua marched up with Gilgal and his entire army, including all the best fighting men, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I've given them into your hands. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. 
The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Bet Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel on the road down from Bet Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. <clears throat> On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. For the sun, and so the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day... When the Lord listened to a man, surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. And then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this miraculous event. And Lord, I, Lord, I know that we could focus today just on what you did, that you actually responded to Joshua and caused the sun to stand still for an entire day. But Lord, I pray that today we'd come away with a wisdom more, more than knowledge, but the application of knowledge, a real wisdom concerning friendships and the alliances that we might make in life. Lord, help us to, to grab everything that's practical and applicable to our lives today from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so there are two very important teachings that are related to these 15 verses. The one uh, that is most noticeable here is and being somewhat of a continuation of last week's message, is that we have to be careful whom we befriend. We need to be discerning about the alliances that we make in life. We need to exercise wisdom whenever we find ourselves desiring to be part of, of any kind of coalition, any caucus of any kind, even if it just be with another single individual, not, not talking exclusively groups, but even another single person. And of course, I'm not implying that we shouldn't be friendly towards others. Or we shouldn't be involved with others. You know, in order to achieve a common goal, there are times we have to come together by committee or maybe by a volunteer group and we work together to achieve something. And maybe sometimes even just for the purpose of fellowship. But what I am saying is that we must be careful with our loyalties and our allegiances because in just one single moment, your personal testimony, our personal testimony can be greatly damaged because of the reputation of the one whom we have befriended. And if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, an, old, if you're an adult, you probably already know this. It probably happened during your childhood. But as we can see from these verses, <clears throat> when we form an alliance with another person or with a group of people, we inherit all of their baggage. The minute we come together with them, all of their baggage comes with them. And in this case, the Gibeonites have become a lightning rod in attracting trouble for Israel, for Joshua and the Israelites. If Joshua had refrained from making a treaty with these people, this band of deceivers, that was last, last week's message, they wouldn't now be facing this moment. But they were deceived into making a treaty because they, they hesitated to really consult God about these people. These people had lied to them. If you, don't, if you didn't remember, they, they had lied to them. So we've come from a long ways away. And all that Joshua and his men did was look at their supplies and say, okay, they didn't, they didn't inquire of the Lord. And they paid a price. And now they're paying an additional price. Because now they have to go to battle with this group of deceivers. That's part of their covenant agreement. Israel inherits all of Gibeon's problems because of this covenant that they made together. And you know, it's amazing to me how many times, and, and in so many places in the Bible, it warns us about making wrong friendships and, and actually sometimes refers to them as unholy alliances. Let me just read to you a few. This is Proverbs eleven fifteen. It says, he who puts up security for another will surely suffer. But whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. Now that's a warning about co-signing for someone else. Because if you do, you're going to suffer. The fact that that, that person needs a co-signer to get a loan means that you're, you're, they're, they're at risk. And now you're at risk. But it says whoever refuses will be safe. Another one, the same advice, it's Proverbs twenty two twenty six. Do not be a man who strikes hands and pledge or puts up security for debts. 
Go back a couple verses. Uh, this is a rather unique warning about association. This is Proverbs twenty two twenty four. It says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with someone who's easily angered. And you know that's going to that's gonna create problems. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 35, 36, 37. Look at this. Later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who was guilty of wickedness. He agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. And after these were built at Ezion Geber, Eliezer, son of Dodavahu of Maharesh, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The ships were wrecked and were not able to set sail to trade. We have a good king who makes an alliance with a bad king and suffers the consequences of God's judgment against that bad king. And remember, too, keep in mind that prior to this venture, prior to this friendship, this relationship, I want you to keep in mind Jehoshaphat had learned the incredible importance and value of seeking Almighty God. And forming an alliance and befriending only him. Only God. And remember, all of Israel was in fear of Moab and Ammon. That they would be crushed by them. And when Jehoshaphat inquires of the Lord. You remember the story. God tells him to send the choir out in front of the army. And as they begin to worship, God fights for them. And the message to me in that event is very simple. Me and God are a majority every time. I don't need a coalition. I, I, don't, need, I don't need a bunch of uh, flesh humans on my side. God and me are a majority. And truth is, when I rely, when I rely too heavily on the strength of someone else, another human being, you know what? I'm essentially putting my trust in the flesh instead of God. And of course, we see in Scripture, we see both in the psalmist and in the prophet Jeremiah, they both inform us, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in the flesh. Again, fleshly alliances almost always end in disaster. You know, I can remember my first pastoral position as a youth pastor and assistant pastor. Arrived at the church, got set up, and I'll tell you, within short time, there were a number of people in that church who were somewhat displeased with the senior pastor. And very carefully, they would come to me and they would try to befriend me. In fact, one family became very close. But before long, I could see that they weren't real friends. But rather, they were an ad hoc committee that wanted me to help them remove their pastor. And then they would make me pastor. Again, it took, it took a few, couple months to, to get those relationships established. And then finally, their motives appeared. This church was about our size. And I have to be honest, to you, honest with you, it would be, I would be thrilled it would have thrilled me as a young pastor, 21 years of age, to pastor a church of that size. You know, knowing that the average church in America across all denominations is 80 people. That's the average size church. That's not a small church. That's an average size church in America. But within a short period of time, I decided that I was not going to be part of that scheme. And so Kathy and I decided to move on. I contacted our district superintendent and then we resigned. Well, within a year... That church had another assistant pastor. And he too, I found out after, he went through the same thing. These people tried to befriend him. They sold him on the idea of, you, if you can help us get rid of our pastor. Now, I don't know what they were expecting. I have an Italian last name, but, you know, get rid of our pastor. And then they would make me pastor and they would make him pastor. And you know what? He, he resigned too. He left. But eventually, you know what? They found their man. See, these unholy alliances always eventually do their damage. Eventually, they found their man. The next assistant pastor actually became co-pastor. Think about this. Co-pastor. That's a two-headed monster. You don't lead with two heads. Anything with two heads is not, it's just not normal. And these people who had wanted me to be involved in their plot, succeeded. And not only did they remove the senior pastor, but they also destroyed the ministry of the man who became co-pastor. And that church went through such a major upheaval. They went to something about our size 
down to two dozen people overnight. Just terrible destruction. You see, we need to be careful who we strike hands with, you know, who we shake hands with, who we agree with. Uh, let's look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. It says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. And here again, mention is made concerning the importance of forming relationships with the approval and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Woe to the obstinate children, it said, who carry out plans that are not mine, who form an alliance, but not by my spirit. And now let's take a look at the New Testament to what Paul writes to the Corinthians. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, 15, and 16. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my teacher, uh, people. And here's a teaching, here's a teaching that we don't hear very often. It's about being unequally yoked. And of course, these verses are speaking of any relationship. Think about it. Between any two people, even groups of people. And we can apply this to business. We can apply this to friendships. We can apply this to marriage. We can apply this to financial involvements. But, but I do want to take a few moments right now and, 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 and ask our young people to apply this passage to their dating habits. That's where, that's where it has to begin. I mean, basically, do not even think about dating a person who's not a Christian. Don't, don't, don't even consider starting a platonic relationship with a member of the opposite sex if they do not know Christ. And, you know, also, don't try to rationalize away these verses. They're simple, they're direct, and they're for you. This is God speaking. And, and I want to take this a step further, too, because, I mean, I think clearly, unequally yoked, right? We, we understand. We all, we're all on the same page. The redeemed should not be in, I'm telling you, you shouldn't be in a business arrangement with a non-believer. You shouldn't have to be married to a non-believer. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be dating a non-believer. That's where it all starts. But I want to take this a step further because I, my understanding of this passage goes a little deeper than just what we can read on the surface here. Not only does this passage tell us that we should not be intricately involved with those who are not of our faith, a faith in Christ, but I also believe that we should not be deeply involved with someone who isn't on the same spiritual plane as we are. And I'm talking about dating. In other words, you know, let's say there's someone in our church. Let's say there's a Christian from another church and they love God. It's clear they love God and they know Jesus is their Savior. But they're not as committed as you are to maybe attending church. Or maybe they know very little about the Bible. And it's not like they're a brand new Christian. Or maybe they don't believe in the same things that you do. The power of prayer. And they, they don't believe in tithing and, and so on. And others, if they're not at the same place that you are at spiritually, then maybe you shouldn't date them. Because although you both know Christ, you're still unequally yoked. And I want to, you know, let me, explain, let me explain it this way. When this scripture is speaking about being yoked, there are a couple rules that everyone 2,000 years ago understood. Foreign to us, but pretty common. One was that you do not yoke together two different kinds of animals. You don't hitch a mule and an ox together. Okay? It's just not going to work. And I think you all get that. But here's the second illustration. You also, it's improper to yoke together two oxen that are not close in size and temperament. Because one is going to struggle against the other. And that's why I believe this passage tells us that only two believers who are at the same level of spiritual awareness should be together. That's how I read that passage. Not just Christian and, and, and non-Christian, but two Christians that are on totally different wavelengths 
concerning their spiritual development. And here, here's another Old Testament verse that just came to mind. It's Amos 3.3. 3. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? In agreement. So if we make careless choices concerning relationships, whether they be romantic, friendships, business partners, whatever, what happens from what we read out of the book of Joshua is we expose ourselves to the consequences of those choices. You see, Joshua had made a hasty decision to befriend the Gibeonites. And now he and Israel pay the price. Now, thankfully, God intervened. I mean, one of the greatest miracles of all times, I mean, unbelievable, took place in that chapter. There's never been a day like that before or since when God made the sun stand still in the sky for an extra complete day. And it says that more of the enemy were killed by hailstones than by Israel's sword. So God was involved. Ultimately, Joshua was victorious. And the same is true for us. It can be true for us. And here's how. First realize that there are two main groups of people in our world. There, one group is the redeemed. It's real simple. And the others are those who are yet to be saved. We have those who are saved and those who are yet to be saved. And obviously we are to relate to each group differently. Okay. First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. Paul writes, I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world, the unsaved, who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. Now notice the instruction is given here. We're to, we are to associate with the unsaved, with the intention of reaching them with the gospel. We're not to date them. We're not to get into business transactions with them like a partnership. But we do have to interact with them. We'd have to leave this world in order to avoid them. So that's, but then Paul says that we are not to fellowship with a so-called brother, a so-called fellow believer, a Christian, who's in sin, sexually immoral. So we are, we are. You see, and I think what it is, we're so different from the world that we will probably always remember in our in interactions with them that this is an interaction that involves ministry, uh, sharing the gospel. That's the reason for that involvement. Our primary purpose of befriending those who don't know Christ is so that we'd eventually be able to introduce them to our friend Jesus Christ. Amen. But in the church body, it's meant to be different. So here, we're admonished to remember that a fellow Christian might not be where we are spiritually. You see, just as there are, there, there are people of many different age groups here this morning, many different national backgrounds, so too there are many different levels of spiritual formation or development among those of us in our assembly this morning. No, no two of us are at the same place spiritual, spiritually in our, in our, in our, in our growth and development. And the Bible in Nehemiah and in Exodus refer to these differences among God's people. Well, God's people are called a mixed multitude. Again, not just race or gender or backgrounds or ethnicity, but also level of spirituality in our walk with God. A mixed multitude. It's a good phrase. And here's the concern. Sometimes... Even in the church, we try to establish a relationship as friends with another Christian when really we have been called to establish a relationship of ministry. That's where I'm trying to go with this. You know, it, it, again, you're, you're going to be friendly. friendly. Friendliness is part of that. And you do befriend them. But if you befriend someone who's not as mature, and you have to make this assessment, if they're not as mature as you, then your position becomes that of mentor. You're to help them. You're to pull them up to where they need to be in the Lord. You're to be an example for them. You're to have influence on them. And if you don't have influence on them, then they might be having influence on you and you're going the other way. You see, I really believe one of the distinctives of the body of Christ is that the majority of our relationships are not just friends in the way of fun friends. I really believe that a lot of our relationships in the church are for the benefit of that other person. 
when we're trying to help them. Or likewise, maybe it's for our benefit because there may be somebody out there that's more mature than we are. And we want, we want to be where they are. And they're encouraging us in that. So basically what I'm saying is that everyone can and should be ministering to one another. And the scriptures are clear in that. In fact, the phrase one another occurs at least 72 times in the New Testament. In the New International Version of the Bible. Love one another, greet one another, have humility towards one another, live in harmony with one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, serve one another. And there's just a host of one another's in the New Testament. And so with that in mind, and although we began with emphasis on the pitfalls of wrong relationships, I want to close this morning with a single emphasis on relating to one another for mutual benefit. I really believe that every relationship, even if it's someone who's on a higher spiritual plane, even if it's someone who's kind of trying to guide you and lead you deeper into your walk with Christ, I really believe that all those relationships are ministry relationships. I mean, I, I can think back as a young pastor, I, I latched on to a, an older minister, 36 years in ministry, and I made him become my friend. I really did. And he was, he, at first I thought maybe he was aloof, but I was, gonna, I was determined. I need to know what he knows. I need his experience. And I made him become my friend. I, I'm not sure how he did it other than persistence. And I think he was a little leery. Why does this young 21-year-old guy, maybe 23 by then, want to be my friend? Because I'm an old man and he's, and, and I'm telling you what, it was, it was an incredible relationship. And he helped me so many ways. And, and later on in his life, he actually told me that I had helped him. Just encouraging him that he would believe in himself, that he had something of value still. So it works both ways. It is mutual. You're not at the same place, but you both can receive a mutual benefit. And so I want to encourage you to find purpose in your relationship with others in this new year that's just around the corner, just a week away. I want you to understand that God has put you here for a very definite reason. And that with most interactions that you're going to have with others are meant to be part of his plan. They're meant to be ministry relationships. For example, if you've made this church your church home, I want you to know the Holy Spirit drew you here and he placed you here. And because he did, you have a purpose. We're told in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So if you're here, that leads me to believe God led you here. And he has a purpose for you. Not just to warm the seat you're sitting in. But, and, and, you know, and not just formal ministry either, of helping with you know, girls ministries or rangers or life groups, but actually forming bonds and relationships with people, healthy relationships where you have an impact on them and they have a mutual impact on you. God has a purpose for our lives. Amen. Amen. And our task is to learn that purpose, accept that purpose, and then honor God as we live that out on a daily basis. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's stand together and let's pray. Lord, I do pray, God, as we get closer and closer to this new year. Lord, we, I believe that you're going to transform your church and our nation. That the last two years of disappointment and discouragement are going to turn around because you are building your church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And Lord, you're building a church with righteous building blocks, righteous stones. You're the, you're the cornerstone. But you are putting all these blocks together. You're, 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 taking a, you're, you're putting together a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Lord, a holy habitation for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I believe that 2022, you are going to do that. And it's going to mean us forming good friendships. Part of it will, will, will involve friendships and relationships and, and making the right alliances led by your Holy Spirit and realizing the purpose you have for us. Lord, how I pray that we would encourage one another, even as we see the day of Christ approaching. Lord, I pray you'd use us for your purpose. And we ask your blessing in all of this. Lord, I pray your blessing on your people today. 
In Jesus' name, amen.